Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, things to come. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and a writer about music and musicians for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and various other publications. I'm joined today by my esteemed co-hosts, uh, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and one of the four hosts of Talk More Talk a video podcast about the solo Beatles. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York City area since 1984. Um, and if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org, and I think they have an app, too, that Darren will tell you about. How are you doing, Darren? I've, uh, I've actually been better, but uh, I'm doing good right now. I'm not going to be on the WFUV for the uh, near future because uh, I went and uh, injured my knee, falling down the stairs at home very gracefully and uh, ruptured uh, my quadriceps tendon in my left knee, which is the same exact injury that I had on my right knee six years ago. So now my knees are even. Um, so basically, it's, it's the type of, uh, you know, the quadriceps tendon connects the kneecap to the quad muscle, which is in the uh, thigh, if I understand it correctly. And when the quadriceps tendon ruptures, which it's not supposed to, mm. uh, it's like cutting the cord. So it's like if you put a, tied a rope to a doorknob and pulled it, the door would open cut the rope and you could pull all you want the door's not opening right so that's essentially what's happened with me if i'm laying down i cannot lift my left leg it's like it doesn't work yikes um mm. this time i don't think it's a complete rupture because i can maneuver it if i'm on my sides six years ago my right leg was like a useless noodle until i had the surgery and then it's a long recovery basically somewhere in the four to five week vicinity before I ever start PT and can actually get it bent a little bit. Mm. So uh, my surgery, that we, we're recording this on uh, on uh, Wednesday the 15th. I know that my surgery will be this coming Monday the 20th. So, so that's the deal. So I'm not on going to be on FUV again until I'm somewhat mobile and able, obviously, to get into work. Uh -huh. So, uh, and, uh, and so folks... Our next show actually could be uh, loaded with painkillers. It could be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this happens to both your knees. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, my surgeon actually told me that if you're susceptible for it to happen, it's going to happen in both knees. I just hope that this does not happen again for a second time in either one of them, and Ooh. that this is it for me. Yeah, that'd be good. Jeez. So, <laughs> anyway. Well, feel better. Um, Thank yeah. you. And our, so our subject this week is one of my favorite solo Beatles albums, uh, actually one of the earliest solo Beatles albums, depending if you count things like The Family Way. And it's Wonderwall Music by George Harrison. And we'll be getting to that after the news. We got some news first. Ken, you want to lead us into that? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's going to be fairly brief. Uh, but we'll start with uh, Paul McCartney sending a video message to Billy Joel at his concert last Thursday at Madison Square Garden, in which Billy celebrated his 70th birthday, and Paul sang happy birthday to him. And in his message, he said, you're actually a very young person compared to some of us. <laughs> but have a great evening. I know the crowd's going to show you a good time. I'm going to sing happy birthday to you, and we love you. So really nice gesture there from Paul. The two of them, as we know, have been friends for a long time, helping each other out with each other's concerts. And um, something else here, a new book is coming out May 24th called Brian Epstein and the Beatles 1964, The Year That Changed the World by Kevin Roach. The book is being sold exclusively for the purpose of raising funds for a statue of Brian to be erected in the Beatles' hometown of Liverpool. 
Mm -hmm. The book tells the story of Brian's ambition to get the Beatles to America, and it also includes contributions from Mike McCartney, Julia Baird, and the American journalist Larry Kane, who traveled with the Beatles on their U.S. tours of 1964 and 65. Okay. Okay. Um, a recent release for Record Store Day, which we talked about uh, maybe the last show or the one before it, was a vinyl EP from Elvis Costello and the Imposters called Purse, which had four songs on it that represent collaborations from Elvis with other artists, including Paul McCartney. Now, of particular interest is the song The Lovers That Never Were, which uh, Elvis wrote with Paul, first appearing on Paul's album Off the Ground, and more recently as demos, both of just Paul and Elvis together, and another with Paul's band at the time on the Flowers in the Dirt archival box set. Mm -hmm. But this recording, from Elvis's EP, is different from all of them. Mm. It's Elvis singing the song entirely without Paul, Paul is nowhere on the record. It's um, actually a slower, bluesier arrangement of the song, and it's also been made available digitally. Mm. And uh, I'm pretty sure, Darren, you have this, right? Yes. Yes, I have it. Um, I have not played it. I have not listened to it yet. Again, another thing that... List, take advice from your friend Darren, folks. When you think to do something, do it at that moment. Don't wait till you injure your knee. Whoops. Sorry, I didn't mean to go back into knee injury mode. No, in all seriousness, I do have the EP. Uh, and I think, are you about to say this, Ken? I, I, I thought I saw somewhere that it will be coming out you know, readily available. Most record store day releases tend to be limited editions. Once they're gone, they're gone. But hmm. I thought I saw somewhere where these songs are, are coming out. I didn't hear that, but we'll look wrong. into it. Yeah. yeah. But it is nice to hear Elvis sing it. Yes, absolutely. By himself. So. I heard a clip of it online. Uh, I haven't heard the other three songs, just the one uh, of the McCartney collaborations. And it's nice. It's very cool. Something to yeah. have. And if you want to check it out, you can always go on YouTube and just play it. Right. So um, two major passings to take note of. There is actress Peggy Lipton, mm -hmm. known for her roles in the TV shows The Mod Squad and Twin Peaks. She was um, rumored to have had a relationship with Paul McCartney. I don't know all the details behind it. There are different stories that you've heard. But, um, Alan, do you know anything about more about the Peggy Lipton situation with, with Paul? Pretty much what you just said, you know. it's, it's I don't have a lot of detail about it, but, um, but it is something that, that has been said. Yeah. Whatever the relationship was, it was very brief mm -hmm. between the two of them. And, of course, as we know, Hollywood legend, star of films and TV, and singer Doris Day died at the age of 97. And she and Paul were known to be friends, Paul admiring her not only for her talent, but for being a big animal lover and her work for animal rights. And Paul actually interviewed Doris when she released her last album called My Heart, which came out in 2011. That interview appeared in Telegraph magazine and can be found online. And Paul, in fact, issued this statement on his website. He says, so sad to hear of Doris Day passing away. She was a true star in more ways than one. I had the privilege of hanging out with her on a few occasions. Visiting her in her Californian home was like going to an animal sanctuary where her many dogs were taken care of in splendid style. She had a heart of gold and was a very funny lady who I shared many laughs with. Her films like Calamity Jane, Move Over Darling, and many others were all incredible, and her acting and singing always hit the mark. I will miss her, but will always remember her twinkling smile and infectious laugh, as well as the many great songs and movies she gave us. God bless Doris. Mm. Really and of, nice work And of there. course, there's another Beatles connection. Oh, there's several. <laughs> <laughs> she gets name checks in Dig It. And one other song? Uh, hmm. I know. Oh, 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 I know. In fact, it's, it's the trivia question on my website this week. Ooh. Apparently, you haven't looked at my website, Alan. No, I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> I was worrying about Darren's knee. See oh, okay. that? Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I know the answer, though. Can I win something? No. Uh, uh, no. 
but can actually, I, can, anyone who listens to the show can then oh, answer. I, can. I shouldn't they, say. <laughs> no, I we'll say. give the answer here. We'll give the answer here. If you, you listen can. to the show, yeah. And I'm going to be playing it on my live broadcast tonight on the air. So anyone that listens to either show will know the answer and can answer oh, okay. to the, the trivia question. Stop but the yourself. other one, the other one is... la Dida. There you go. Very good, yeah. Darren. Just like Doris Day said, right? Okay. And there's even more of a connection. Because, since we just mentioned K Sera Sera, Mary Hopkin from mm. the version of that song, which Paul produced, and Paul played bass on it, and um, electric guitar and acoustic guitar, and Ringo drummed on it. And it was a single. Yeah. So, a Doris Day song that she's probably best known for. Yep. Probably more so than all the others. And Mary Hopkin covered it, and Paul was very involved with it, as was Ringo. And there's one other connection that I know of, and that is that Ringo covered Sentimental Journey, which was Doris Day's first hit with the Les Brown Orchestra in 1945. Mm-hmm. Look at you, Ken. <laughs> so, lest anyone accuse us of bringing in irrelevant things to the news part, uh, no. just so you know. Give, give Ken <laughs> ten more minutes and we'll link it all to Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I have a news item, actually. I don't know. Do you have any more, Ken? Uh, one more thing. Go ahead. Um, Julian Lennon's newsletter tells us that a new play will be opening in Liverpool. It's called This Girl, the Cynthia Lennon Story. Huh. And it's going to run at the Hope Street Theater, August 21st through the 26th. And that's all the news I've got. And I just would like to add one more thing. There is um, Yoko Ono is going to be involved in the River to River Festival uh, in New York City. Uh, The 18th annual River to River Festival happening in downtown uh, Manhattan, June 18th through the 29th. There will be, if I'm reading this correctly there's going to be two two exhibitions of her two displays of her artwork that will be part of the river to river festival Mm. um one is called the reflection project with yoko ono the other is yoko ono add color and i believe that's going to be something where folks can paint on this boat and the area around the boat make their own contributions. And um, these two events will be uh, happening throughout the entire festival, which runs from June 18th to the 29th, the River to River Festival downtown. They don't exactly make it easy to figure out what venues. I think there's going to be several venues around Manhattan. So the easiest thing to do is to go to lmcc.net that's what i'm looking at right now that's the lower manhattan cultural council so that's lmcc.net or just google river to river festival 2019 new york city and you'll find it okay very good there darren so let's talk a little bit about uh the major release of last week which was paul's Egypt Station, the Traveler's Edition, and I know, Alan, you got your copy, Mm -hmm. copy, whatever you call it, (laughs) in the mail, and Darren also had it as well. What would you like to tell us about it, Alan? Well, um, it's a somewhat heftier little suitcase than I expected it to be, Uh, but I guess in a way it has to because it's got to have the LPs in it, so it's got to at least be... 12 inches in one direction and that's actually the short direction so it's 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 maybe a couple of feet you know Mm -hmm. and it's you know it's solid and it's um blue you've seen pictures of it probably uh it has the lp you know the double lp 180 gram of the main egypt egypt station album it's got the bonus materials, which are Frank Sinatra's party and uh, what is it, 66th Street or something? What street? 60, 62nd 60 Street. 62nd Street. I figured it was some street that has no particular um, resonance for very much, you know. But anyway, you know. 
And then a few, I think four live cuts and uh, a long version of Who Cares, which is basically just Who Cares with a sort of jam at the end. Not mm-hmm. much of a jam, really. It just sort of goes on for a while. It's what like else? a riff that keeps repeating over and over. Yeah. And, and it, it actually reminds me a little bit of, because there was like um, lead guitar work on an acoustic guitar, uh-huh. which uh, sort of reminded me of the end of Heaven on a Sunday, in a way. Although yeah. that's trading off electric and acoustic. Guitars. Yeah. Now, yeah, you, I kind of figured that it, it sounded like it was something that they had sort of left for later to add more instruments on the end if they were going to and then didn't so that's that's the uh the main musical stuff uh there is also the cassette version of egypt station and there is also the accordion cd version one of the one of the different packagings um but that has no bonus materials on it strangely the bonus materials seem to be just on the lp although a few days before the thing turned up in the mail people who ordered it got an email saying that there was a high res download it's uh, these are wav files at uh, 2496 so it's high resolution and um, that included all of the musical materials there is also uh okay there's a little notebook with some of the lyrics in it i I don't know mine has a lot of blank pages and i'm wondering if that is the way they all are Uh, someone else out there got it uh you can write to us and let us know there is the puzzle there's a little envelope with a a tiny red seal on it uh, that if, when you open it up, uh, it just has a note from Paul, a handwritten note from Paul. I'm sure it's a printed up handwritten note from Paul. Uh, I doubt he wrote 3,000 of these. They uh, and, and it just hopes that, you know, you have a wonderful journey because I guess he thinks that people are actually going to take this suitcase on trips you know anyway let's see what else there's right i said the puzzle right there's a deck of playing cards a number of these things you know like i'm not going to open up the puzzle i'm not going to open up the playing cards those things will stay sealed uh the note um just had a that little red sealing thing and you could peel it open if if you actually had to rip it i would have left it probably as it was although i was curious what was in this envelope I hear, however, that if you finish the puzzle by um, tonight, tonight is May 15th, and you guys will be hearing this later, but the rumor was that if you finish the puzzle by tonight and somehow got in touch with them, there was some sort of freebie that you got. No idea what. (laughs) There is also uh, a little rubber sort of pyramid-like thing, sort of like one of the pictures on the album cover. And uh, when you you sort of pull the bottom off, and the larger part of it is a USB drive. And the USB drive has audio files and video files on it. The audio files are just the three bonus tracks from, from the Target version. I think in England it was an HMV version. Now, on my copy strangely enough uh get started doesn't get finished maybe that was a joke but it's a minute shorter than the album cut and it's not like an edit it just stops a minute before the end which is weird because if it, if it was sort of like if if the file had transferred incompletely when they made this copy of the USB drive then it wouldn't have played at all, you know. But this plays, it just stops a minute short of the end of the song. Um, and the others are just the, the tracks from uh, from the Target version. The video is mostly video versions of the four audio uh, bonus tracks, you know, Grand Central Station, one from Abbey Road, one from The Cavern. Um, and there is an extra one, which is a second version of Come On To Me. 
cut to footage from the James Corden thing and from various live performances and you know all sorts of stuff. So it, so it's like a, a a more standard promo rather than just a lo- a single live version. Mm. And uh, and that's about it. Not sure what I'm going to do with this thing. I might sort of package it back up in the huge box it came in. Um, now that I've taken the audio and video off the USB drive uh, and just sort of store it away until who knows what. <laughs> until my heirs need to sell it and say, what the hell is this? Check this uh, out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, my copy came on Monday and unfortunately being that uh, I have one leg, I've not been able to... I, I actually did kind of gently, with one crutch, slide it to uh, the side of the room so it's kind of out of the way, waiting for me to be in better spirits and more mobile, and I will tear into my uh, my copy. But uh, actually kind of looking forward to seeing, you know, what it's all about, hearing your description and looking at pictures, and, and I'm staring at it across the room. There it is against the wall waiting for me. Yeah, uh, but, I mean, um, it's kind of a cool little package, I got to say, um, you know, it's just that pretty much everything in it I had or don't need, like the playing cards and the jigsaw puzzle. But I mean, as a, a, a promotional collectible item, it, it, it really is pretty extensive and expensive, but, it you know, it was kind of nice. And I mean, got to say in the picking the right wife department um paula's reaction to it was i'm really glad you got that that's kind of (laughs) cool so yeah no my wife's uh, while we were waiting for uh, one of my uh umpteen blood tests that i've had uh pre-operation uh i told her gee my paul mccartney suitcase is probably uh, i didn't even finish the sentence and she rolled her eyes (laughs) (laughs) so uh and the rest of the sentence was is probably waiting for me for us when we get home not that i could do anything about it but yeah but i'm looking forward to uh digging into it eventually yeah i didn't order the uh traveler's edition myself i did order the explorer's edition which they tell me is going to arrive on the 23rd of may but uh thankfully because of alan i've heard the bonus audio so we could talk about that here yeah we're recording this on may 15th uh wednesday so the officially it's supposed to be out Friday, the 17th, I guess. If you find a store that might stock it, you could find it in stores as a Friday. This is the Explorer's Edition, not the Suitcase Traveler's Edition, but the Explorer's Edition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Alan has been kind enough to provide Ken and I with the audio of uh, the what is what they refer to in the press releases as Egypt Station 2. Hmm. Right, the second, uh, uh, like the bonus tracks disc to this uh, new deluxe Explorer's edition of uh, Egypt Station. Yeah, it's basically all the audio that's not on the standard Egypt Station. So you have the two songs that were on the Target version, plus uh, Get Enough, which was the digital release that came out at the beginning of this year, plus, as we mentioned, Frank Sinatra's Party and 62nd Street, two songs that we had not heard of at all or heard before until this release. And the, the extended version of Who Cares and the four live cuts. Mm-hmm. But even still, you know, I don't know if you remember this, before Egypt Station even came out, Paul gave a number like there were 27 songs altogether. So even if you added up everything that's been released now, it still doesn't come out to 27. And I doubt that he was referring also to the live songs. No. So there may be other material that still hasn't come out yet. Yeah, the Vacationers edition and the <laughs> <laughs> the Seaside edition. <laughs> Maybe he'll massage these tunes into a new album, the next album. Mm. Uh, who knows? Or like uh, like you said, Alan, we've got another deluxe coming. Yeah, this one's going to come in a surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to find out what... Um, well, I think, Darren, you told me before that you hadn't heard the new McCartney songs. But, Alan, what do you think? I have heard them. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, I, I just had um, I had trouble uh, so with my uh, the audio on the live tracks for some reason, just the live. But the studio tracks, you know, and of course, three of them we knew already. 
So it's for mainly the full version of Who Cares and Frank Sinatra's Party and 62nd Street, which are kind of the newer of the batch. Mm. But uh, Alan, uh, proceed. Yeah, no, I don't have a lot to say about them. It, they're, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra's Party. Um, it's another, you know, one of those champion McCartney lyrics, fee fi fo fum I'm not the only Englishman. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I believe that is actually a pretty old song, like from the seventies, that he has sort of revived. And the Where other did you one, hear that? not sure. Hmm. Probably someplace on the internet, so it must be true. I haven't <laughs> seen any paperwork for it, so. Uh, but I'll, I'll look now. Now that I have something specific to look for, uh, but um, I think I had read that it was from the mid seventies doesn't really sound like it though so i mean that could be wrong uh and the other one the other one i you know they're they're perfectly nice tunes um they didn't really do anything for me either way i didn't hate them didn't love them they were just sort of you know standard mccartney album kind of tracks you know not not something he'd release as a single i don't think so so on to you darren you probably have more to say about it yeah, um, well, the uh, Frank Sinatra's party and 62nd Street, basically I ended up, when I was taking my notes, writing the same thing down for both songs. Harmless ditties. Yeah. Uh, I, I could do without the fee fi fo fum part in Frank Sinatra's party, but ultimately they struck me as the type of tracks that were, would pop up as the bonus tracks when Off the Ground came out or Flowers in the Dirt or uh, maybe... Um, uh, a third or fourth single to come off one of Paul's older albums in England, and the B-side was a track that wasn't available in the U.S., you know, and was a lesser song. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like what Frank Sinatra's party and 62nd Street were to me. Those type of, you know, they're harmless, they're McCartney. Some artists wish that they could come up with things that McCartney could toss aside like that. Mm. The melodies are very McCartney. The lyrics, nothing substantial. But then again, I always felt that a lot of Egypt Station is sort of simple lyrically. So it fits in with that. And I kind of feel the same way. We all know nothing for free. The Target edition. Yeah. Uh, again, glad to have it. Okay song. Couldn't hum you a, a bar of it. But Get Started, I really like. I think that's a very cool song that... Um, would definitely have been one of the highlights of the album had it made the regular edition of Egypt Station. Who cares the full length? I liked it. The coda was sort of, again, disposable, but there's nothing wrong with it. it I can't tell whether or not it was something that was tagged on later on or Paul always envisioned it as being, what would it be, about five or six minutes in length total and then decided to trim it. Who cares? Take the coda off. The coda makes Who Cares twice as long as the album version. And again, it's something to have. It's something different. It's something extra. It's not going to, you know, you're not going to have a religious experience after listening to it. But my opinion of Get Enough really has not changed. Uh, again, I'd, I'm glad to have it in a, uh, like a physical form. I think that if Paul stripped it down to being just a basic piano ballad, it would be a little more acceptable. I can't get past all the auto-tuning. It just seems like he's decided try he's trying too hard to make a contemporary pop song mm -hmm. you know with the tricks that you know would be used today and he's decided to experiment with one of his lesser tunes you know let's put some bells and whistles on this song and you know mm -hmm. not not put it on one of the key album tracks we'll experiment with get enough and uh you know people will soon enough forget the tune ultimately and not to knock it, not to sing, but ultimately these extra songs always seem to, as time passes, be forgotten. Hmm. I mean, we remember them that, that they're there, but go somebody hum me a bar to party party. You know what I mean? From the flowers in the dirt. Uh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this... This, uh... That's best you do? No, I'm kidding. Sounds like me <laughs> next week on Painkillers. Um... Egypt Station, this box set, the suitcase, the Traveler's Edition, sort of reminded me a little of the, in a way, the flowers in the dirt, 
what was that called? That special tour pack that they put out. Um, oh, that whole box set thing. It yeah. was supposed to look like it was in uh, like a road case or something. Right. But it was really a cardboard facsimile of a road case. And when right. you opened it all up, you basically got everything you had already, except uh, what was a party party was like on a three inch CD. Right. And there may have been another mix of Oue Le Soleil. But other than that, you got stuff that you basically had, if my memory serves correct. It's in safekeeping somewhere down in my music room that hasn't been touched in a while. But this just seems like a modern day, tw this suitcase, getting back to it for a second, kind of reminds me there's a modern day 21st century version of what came out in, what would that have been, 90, I guess, of Flowers in the Dirt, late 89, 90, that, that mm -hmm. uh, Traveler's uh, edition. But, and the live tracks, I actually, unfortunately, could not get my uh, audio to work. The live tracks that appear on Egypt Station 2 in this Explorers edition. But it's not like those are a big deal because no. you know, as soon as they were they were all broadcast, basically, or professionally filmed and taped and most of them put out on BBC or uh, in the case of Grand Central, um, I think live on YouTube. So basically everyone already had these tracks in quality that's about as good as this quality. So... Those were a little bit of a letdown in a way. I mean, not a letdown. I mean, they were what you expected them to be because you already knew them, you know. Hmm. The live tracks, in a way, remind me of when the new deluxe edition came out, and there were live tracks for, from songs specifically from new. Right. And the only way that you can get any of these songs commercially on a CD would be to get the deluxe version. Right. You know, same thing with this. So he picked the four songs that he's done live can be station and made sure that there was something to represent it live in this package. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. But, um, gosh, there's so many things I wanted to bounce off of what you said there, Darren. But uh, I do agree with you about Get Started. I think that's an outstanding song. It's very 70s Wings-ish to me. Yeah. And, in yeah. fact, um, there's an acoustic guitar... Uh, line that's played in there that's very similar to what was used in My Brave Face if you listen very carefully to that you'd have to listen to both songs back to back to know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. I totally disagree with you about Nothing for Free I think that's an outstanding song and it's very <laughs> catchy and you know, if it was released as a single today and Top 40 Radio was to play Paul which they won't then it would be a hit, in my opinion. It's very contemporary sounding. All I need is one or two listens, and I know exactly how the song goes. It's not disposable to me. And one of the things, you were talking about, you know, all this bonus material that Paul puts out through the years on CD singles and whatnot. Some of that stuff is very interesting to my ears because he experiments a bit on some of those songs and figures they don't fit on the albums. And so a lot of people might gravitate towards those songs a lot, and many people also think that those songs deserve to be on the albums more than the songs that he chose, especially with Off the Ground. There's a lot of great material from Off the Ground that he didn't put on the album. And some of the other mm -hmm. songs, like Long Leather Coat, for example, or, or Kicked Around No More, those songs might be better, in your opinion, than the ones that were on the album. I felt that way about a lot of this stuff, from Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, a lot of the... The bonus material there. So I like when he does this because it gives you something extra to listen to. Mm -hmm. It's no different. It's no different than when you had a non LPB side or an EP. That's really what these CD singles are in a way. EPs, songs mm. that were not on the album. So you got something extra there. And you know, I think Paul sometimes has this image of himself of what the public expects from him. And sometimes he puts the more experimental stuff that he's done as bonus material just to put it out there for people who kind of search for that for that mm -hmm. side of the ball so um, yeah the two songs, the two new songs uh, that I hadn't heard before from Egypt Station Frank Sinatra's Party, I like a lot it's catchy as hell and it just amazes me how the man never has lost that gift for coming up with catchy tunes <laughs> it never ends, the wealth of material this man has given us and the only problem I have with Frank Sinatra's party 
is that it really sounds kind of demo-ish in terms of production. It just sounds like um, he played all the instruments. Nothing wrong with that. He's done that many times. I don't know, Alan, if, if they, in the Traveler's Edition, do they give you any information about the musician's credits on the, these other songs? Um, well, I actually have not um, slit open the LP version of it, so it's conceivable that they're in there, but I haven't looked. Okay. And I don't mind the fee fi fo fum <laughs> in uh, Frank Sinatra's party, just like I didn't mind uh, the Hillmen part in um, Pretty Little Head, for that matter. <laughs> um, it's just extremely catchy, and once I have it in my head, it's stuck there. And I like this little nod that he gives to Frank Sinatra and the people of that period, Angie Dickinson and um, Dino Martin, uh, who Peter Lawford is mentioned in the song. Right. It's very cute. Um, I like it a lot. And um, the other song, 62nd Street, has Paul on that very soft vocal, very much like Distractions in a way. And it's kind of uh, light jazz. And it's a great melody. And he has these tempo changes in it that make it interesting. So I enjoyed those two songs a lot. The live cuts, eh, they're not that great. When I listen to um, Come On To Me, Paul's voice is so weak on that particular song. But then again, um, the live version of Who Cares is really strong. So I wish that um, given this opportunity, especially with the Travelers Edition, all these concerts that he gave at historic venues like the Cavern and, and um, Abbey Road and at Lippa, Grand Central Station, he could have put out full video concerts of this stuff. And instead, you only get one song from each. So, um, you know, that's a shame right there. But, you know, I'm glad that I have these extra songs on each station. You know, it's, it's just something more to, to look forward to. And I, like we just said before, I'll bet you there's going to be another version that comes out because... There can't. There has to be more than this. <laughs> I really believe that. So, yeah, I agree with you. It simply can. I'd rather have them than not all of these songs. And I'm liable. Uh, I'm liable to, you know, find one day, the 62nd Street really, you know, uh, strikes a chord with me. Uh, mm -hmm. can, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. And again, as I mentioned before, there are artists who wish that they could come out with melodies that McCartney is just issuing as extra tracks and b-sides and whatnot you know that even when he's maybe just uh whipping up something quick he's still able to come up with something that a sizable portion of his fan base enjoys mm -hmm. you know, maybe not everyone that's okay but a good portion of his fan fan base enjoy you know these songs you know even though they aren't primo mccartney well, i'd rather have them than that you know, I, 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 I just think philosophically this business of treating bonus tracks as if they can be expected to be lesser, prob I have a, a problem with that. I mean, the money that you spend on them, which in this case on a track-by-track -track basis is many multitudes more than you spent on the actual album tracks. And if you're going to put stuff out and put it out for you know in this case an exceptional amount of money although the tra the explorer's edition will be just sort of normal amount of money i mean mm. why should we if let's let's just make it as easy as can be and say we pay a dollar a track for each of these tracks why should a track that we're paying a dollar for that is a bonus track be considered lesser than a track that we're paying a dollar for that's on the album it's the same dollar it's not like we're actually only giving him 85 cents you know what i mean these things are being offered publicly for sale mm -hmm. and and in this case uh since at the time egypt station was released he already announced that he was going to put out extra material you got to assume that he knew that the extra material was going to be up to his standard or or not, but you would assume that he would think it was. You know, I have this much stuff that I really think is good, but only this much will fit on a CD, so there will be other versions that will have the extra stuff. I, I, I just don't think that... Um, I think that it should be sort of 
judged and expected to be just as good as anything else. And as Ken said um, earlier, I mean, some of his B-sides and things actually have been better than some of the album tracks. I'm mean, Flying to My Home is one that I always think. I, mm-hmm. I, I always thought yeah. that was better than a lot of stuff on Flowers in the Dirt. Um, I agree. So, you know, I, I don't know that we have to necessarily give them a pass because they're uh you know bonus tracks i i think we should hold them up to the same yardstick as everything else yeah in fact i just had one of my facebook friends who listens to this show james boyce uh write to me saying that these two songs frank sinatra's party and 62nd street he prefers those over say people want peace Mm -hmm. or a confidant you know he likes those songs more so you could, you could listen to all this bonus material and think that it's better than some of what's on his albums. Mm-hmm. And I really think Paul is one of the worst judges of his own material. That's just my own opinion. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, he's kind of said that. He has kind of said that himself. You know, I mean, once when I interviewed him, he basically said, you know, look, I write them all. So I like them. You know, if I'm going to bother recording them, I like them enough to do that. So it's hard for me to judge which ones are the best to go on the album or be on a B side or be withheld. And, and, and what he said he did is he tends to play them to his kids and their friends and mm. see what they react to. Yeah. So it's tough when you're the artist, you have no idea how the public's going to receive your work, mm-hmm. but Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's get on to the main topic, uh, which is George's Wonderwall. And, uh, you know, when this came out in late 68, roughly around the same time as the White Album, I think actually a little bit earlier, um, I picked it up then and uh, really was taken with it. I mean, you know, you didn't know entirely what to expect from a solo George album. You know, he had been doing his Indian stuff and he had been, you know, getting back into straightforward rock stuff. And this album actually has a lot of everything. I mean, the tracks are fairly short. And I think later in an interview, he he described it as a sort of... uh, you know, omnibus overview of Indian music to introduce people to it, but it's not just Indian music. It's uh, and it and it goes back and forth between Indian and rock, and there's a, a little country tune and and really everything. And I thought it was completely a delight when I got it. I used to listen to it just about daily back then. So let's start with you know what you guys think about it. Shall we start with um, Darren? Yeah, sure. Um, of course, like anything else that came out in the late 60s, I came to Wonderwall Music many, many years later. I don't recall when. I think I had, I think memory serves correct, I had purchased an import on vinyl, an Apple import, might have been German or maybe British, probably at some point in the, could have been in the 80s. But anyway, and then of course, when it did finally come out on CD in the early 90s, of the first time uh, was when I really uh, I think that was when I really sunk my teeth into it could put it on obviously the convenience of the CD you put it in and hear the whole thing start to finish and uh, try to figure out what the song titles what each melody you know what the title was I always enjoyed it because I felt like it just encapsulated where George's head was at at that point in the late 60s uh, when given free reign to uh, experiment a bit with stuff that he was intrigued by, where he didn't have to worry about uh, getting the approval of John and Paul. He didn't have to write a pop song that might have a hit potential. You know, he was just able to sink his teeth into this new love of his, relatively new love of his Indian music, and also compose uh, with a film in mind. I would imagine, trying to think now, it was... Yeah, it would have been like, I guess, the first time that George really was able to flex his muscles as an individual artist for a sustained period of time and show not only am I capable of holding my own against John and Paul, but here I'm, I've done a movie soundtrack. You know, I've done uh, what at that point must have been viewed as somewhat of an experimental album. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and last, our last show talked about how Ringo's first album, that was a topic last show, Sentimental Journey. In a way, you could say that Ringo was a trendsetter by doing an album of standards in 1970 when that was unheard of for a rock musician to do that material. Here you have George Harrison doing an album that many, many years later would get very neatly and easily pigeonholed into the world music category. Mm -hmm. Thus making Wonderwall music arguably one of the earliest, if not the first, world music albums. At least one that was presented to a pop audience. Mm -hmm. But do you but, think with, uh, the, with the Western things on it and things like Red Lady 2, which is just a, a pretty little piano waltz, um, do you think that it still can count as a world music album since yeah. it goes back and forth? Because it's 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 some some it's, it's summarizing music of the world, and that includes what we have here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Country American music, whatever it might be, is world music to other ears elsewhere on the globe. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, sure. And and George actually I don't know if he, he this probably wasn't his intention here, but he does kind of connect some dots also with all of these melodies. And the album plays. I'm sure most people listening to this know it. Uh, it plays like a soundtrack. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a little disjointed, which is m what some soundtrack albums are like, because it's lots of incidental music meant for certain scenes, but in a sort of kind of obtuse way, sort of ties together. And again, George probably didn't intend to do this, but he connected some dots there and bringing together something like Red Lady 2 with uh, maybe a heavier Indian track. Mm -hmm. and have them close to one another on one side of an album. Right. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Ken? Well, I would echo a lot of what Darren just said. I find that Wonderwall music fascinates me more now than it ever has before, especially since when it comes to the Indian songs that George wrote in the Beatles that I now recognize as being so brilliant. I mean, Within You, Without You, to me, is now... Uh, I regard as a masterpiece. And when you talk about world music and making uh, the world aware of this, it may be more important that George did this in the Beatles with those three songs, with the inner light and also love you too, within you, without you. But I like the fact of what, what Darren just said about George sinking his teeth into this. This is the only time when George really went heavy with the Indian music even though he worked with Ravi Shankar later on and, and produced albums for him and supported Ravi with the concert for Bangladesh, the fact that he composed these songs, and it's a completely different style than the pop music of the Western world. He had to learn Indian instruments, the different sounds of the Indian instruments, and um, just the way that it's structured, the, the way that you would write Indian music has got to be different in terms of meters and um you know the notes i'm sure are very different than it is on western instruments he had someone named john barham um involved with this who uh worked with ravi shankar and understood indian instruments and did notation for george uh, actually for the indian musicians for these tracks but just to to come up with these pieces of music and um, to fit it into the movie where it was needed, I find it all so very fascinating. Uh, I wish that there was some video that we could watch of George composing this stuff or going through it with the Indian musicians. I know that in the last few years, we've had the bonus tracks on the Sgt. Pepper box set of George talking to the Indian musicians and, and actually singing the melody of within you without you to them because that's the only way he could communicate with them what he, what he wanted in the song and likewise uh, a few years ago when wonderwall music came out and you had bonus tracks released with it there was an alternate take of the inner light you hear a little bit of that in the very beginning talking to the indian musicians what he wanted it would be fascinating to me to see how george absorbed all this stuff all the different instruments all the different sounds and, you know, there's different instruments that were used in Wonderwall music. It's not just uh, tabla and sitar. There's other instruments 
like for example they they mentioned this um this instrument which i don't know if this is the correct pronunciation uh shanae or shanae mm -hmm. which is a a double reed instrument when you hear it it's kind of harsh sounding right maybe like a harsh bassoon <laughs> if you can envision that that's that's what i'm thinking but when you hear tracks like microbes in particular that's the main instrument that you hear and so george must have heard this he must have felt it was right for that moment in the movie and um you know there's, there's so many aspects of of this of the album that i find fascinating you don't just have the Indian music. You do have, like you said, Red Lady 2, which, I don't know, almost sounds a little classical to me. Yeah. Don't you think, Alan? Mm -hmm. um, and Drilling a Home, which is like a ragtime piece. Right. And um, cowboy music with Tommy Riley playing harmonica. Yeah. And then there's Skiing, which is a rock track, although it's the same guitar riff played over and over, which Eric Clapton actually plays. Mm -hmm. And um, there's Party Seacomb, which is a rock track. It's a good instrumental track. But, you know, I was just thinking that the purpose of scoring music in a movie when it's instrumental is to set the mood and not be so distracting that you're focusing more on the music than the movie. And this music works on that level. But it's also fascinating when you just listen to the album just as pieces of music because you have all this variety on the album with a heavy dose of Indian music and... It's just so much more involved to me than uh, the stuff he was doing on, on the Beatle tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like the variety of it um, and the fact that it's not he didn't put all the Indian music on one side and all the Western music on the other. He just went back and forth between them. And, uh, you know, I, I just... I just was entranced with it as soon as I put it on and uh, and, and really used to listen to it a lot. And I, I'm not sure entirely why, you know, most of the things, most of the rock things I listened to in those days had lyrics and this is totally an instrumental album, but it was still sort of an instrumental album different from, say, a classical instrumental album. It, it just had so much going on. I mean, I loved hearing that Clapton track, um, Skiing. Uh, even mm. though it's repetitive, I mean, that is such a classic Eric Clapton sound. You know, yeah. you, you, you can't not know who it is if you've listened to, you know, Cream at the time and, and everything else. And uh, then you look on the, the track list and it says Eddie Clayton because of all the contractual, you know, problems that they had. Uh, uh, Ringo is actually given a pseudonym too. Is it Richard something? I can't remember offhand, but um, I wonder why, because there was obviously no contractual issue with Ringo. Hmm. You know? Oh. This was an Apple record, so um, you know, Ringo was one of the owners. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the album also went on to influence uh, so many artists decades later. Got to mention, of course, Oasis had their song Wonderwall, mm -hmm. and uh, w w of which I believe the t name Wonderwall was the only connection. But that's definitely a nod to George, early George, and the and the Wonderwall music album. And I am sure the band Coola Shaker uh, spent uh, many a night listening to uh, Wonderwall music as they were developing their sound. So it's an album that has uh, may have spent some years in obscurity maybe in the 70s and sort of got dusted off then over the course of the 80s and then of course became readily available in the age of the cd mm -hmm. you know i wonder with some of the indian tracks i mean i'd really be very curious to know to what degree he composed them versus sort of collected them you know like getting a bunch of indian musicians into a studio and having them play certain traditional things, maybe uh, producing the session saying, you know, okay, how about more of this, less of that, uh, you know, maybe have it go into this other one that you just played 10 minutes earlier, you know, whatever. It's, 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 it's kind of hard to know. I mean, I had heard that the inner light, for instance, was basically a traditional Indian piece. So I'm, I'm, really curious to know 
if that's true, if he wrote these melodies, wrote these arrangements, wrote the tunes, you know, or whether he was there sort of as a, a, a collector of sounds and, you know, just sort of roped them all together into specific tracks that he wanted them to be, you know, mm-hmm. if he was an editor in a way. But that's a kind way to look at it. I mean, a, a, someone looking at it less kindly might say a carpetbagger, you know. Uh, and today you hear all over the place cultural appropriation, you know. There's, oh, you know, George went to India, culturally appropriated all of their stuff, you know. And I really hate that because to me, when I hear people talk about cultural appropriation in terms of you know, taking other people's music and stuff. It, it, to me, that betrays a complete ignorance of how music history works, worked, has always worked, will always work. You know, people travel around and they hear things, musicians, and they add them to their own arsenal. And then someone hears them and adds it to their own arsenal. That's just the way music has always developed. And... uh but, you know, I mean, I could see how in today's landscape, someone coming new to Wonder Wall music might just say cultural appropriation. That kind of reminds me of uh, Band on the Run and Paul being accused of stealing, you know, African rhythms and all. Right. At the time. But, yeah, I've wondered the same thing myself, Alan. You know, I, I've read that a few of the pieces here at Wonder Wall music, the Indian pieces, were based on a raga, mm-hmm. a previous raga. Right. So how much of it was really composed entirely by George? I mean, just based on what we heard from, as I was mentioning before, Within You, Without You, and The Inner Light, when George is instructing the Indian musicians what he wants, mm-hmm. how much of that actually happened during these sessions? Right. He may have known the exact melody, and he may have sang it to them, or he might have said, I want this instrument to be used for this melody, but he couldn't write it down, so he had John Barham do that kind of work for him. You need to know someone like John, who's still around, Mm -hmm. who could probably tell you more about those sessions. Mm. But, um, yeah. In fact, I had read that um, the last track on the first side called Dream Scene, which is made up of three very distinct pieces of music, it's very much very uh, eclectic and experimental, and one could even say maybe maybe avant-garde-ish. Mm-hmm. And according to one source that I read, this was done before Revolution Number no. Nine. Right, mm-hmm. right. It it has some of those same techniques. It's interesting now, because um, because George was um, very sort of self-conscious about doing avant-garde kind of stuff. It obviously interested him. I mean, he put out an album of um, basically synthesizer experiments. Uh, mm-hmm. And and then there is this dream scene. And yet, you know, when he talks about, for instance, or talked about electronic sound, for instance, he, he would always quote Alvin Lee as saying, yeah, avant-garde, avant-garde a clue, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it seems like he... Wanted to do it, but also wanted to distance himself from it. But, you know, the dream scene is actually a really interesting piece. And, uh, you know, he's got nothing to be ashamed of there. I think all the Indian stuff is very interesting. Mm -hmm. It all depends on on how involved you want to get in studying this stuff. I know that for a lot of people, Indian music is, is, it takes a lot of patience to listen to it. Kind of like classical music. You know, a lot of it's long pieces. But fortunately for those people, if you listen to Wonderwall music, a lot of it are short pieces, like you said, Darren. So um, it's also more digestible if you mix it up with all these other styles of music. I have a question for you, Alan, because this is something that I've been wanting to know for for quite a while. But I'm sure you know that with Drilling a Home, Mm -hmm. there is a bootleg of Magical Mystery Tour stuff. And there is a take of Flying where it ends with, what sounds like the same backing as what's on Drilling a Home. Hmm. Hmm. You never heard that? I yeah. know that there's uh, the version of Flying that then has all the flying backwards. It's possible that I never got to the end of it. <laughs> I, but I, it does sound it vaguely familiar. Yeah, it yeah. rings a bell, too, for, for me. So I'm thinking that George was experimenting, because the way I understood it, 
that that backing, that ragtime feel and the beat was probably something you could program on the Mellotron, and he was playing with it probably around the time of Magical Mystery Tour. You know, <laughs> get, it's, we're getting close here in time to Wonderwall, and yeah. maybe he used that and really embellished on that with Drilling a Home, which is a fascinating piece of music. You'd yeah. never think that George would compose something that's ragtime, an instrumental ragtime piece. So I love it for that aspect of it, too. Yeah. You know, I, I, like I said, with, with the Indian music, I love listening to this stuff, but I sure wish now that George had spent more time on it and do more with Indian music to this degree. Mm -hmm. It would have mm -hmm. been really fascinating. And also, uh, aside from when uh, a rock band like the Beatles would make movies and put their own songs in it, and I know you mentioned The Family Way, Alan, which I don't really consider in the same category as this, because the family way is really one melody and variations on the same melody and nothing else. Yeah, this is all different music, all different pieces. Right. Can you think of a time when a rock musician was asked to score an entire film like this? You know, and, and I don't know if you know this, but in doing some reading on on Wonderwall. I discovered that the Bee Gees were actually offered to do this before George, huh. and they they declined. So, um, yeah, that led to George that, doing it. But. <laughs> that would have been different. Oh, very well, like, different. <laughs> I would imagine that, you know, of course, the movie's music didn't necessarily have to lean Indian, and the Bee Gees would have come up with something completely different. George took the opportunity to do this music, uh, to do the soundtrack to the film and decided, hey, you know what, I'm going to use this as a way to kind of get some some of this other stuff that I really like into people's ears. Now, it was perfect for the time and for the vibe of the movie. It was perfect. Yeah, it really fit the psychedelic feel of the movie. Mm -hmm. The Indian music. Right. A couple of uh, random uh, questions for Alan. You bought Wonderwall music and the White Album simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I don't think you bought Two Virgins. I did buy two virgins, but you not did? then. I uh, I'm thinking it was earlier because I I, <laughs> I bought two virgins off of a friend at school who had bought it and decided really he just wanted to have a look at the cover. He didn't like the music and he didn't want it, so he asked if anyone wanted to buy it, and I said, "Yeah, I'll take it." So, um, and I. So I don't know why I'm thinking it was the spring. It can't have been the spring because they recorded it in late May. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I did buy that shortly after it came out as well, and I can't remember whether it was before or after the White Album and this. And that's when Alan got detention when the teacher checked his bag and found porno in the... Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you all the teachers wanted to see it. Uh, <laughs> and I made them promise that there would be no ramifications for me if I let them. <laughs> Alan, I'm wondering, because at the, uh, when, we, when you first started talking about this album, you said it's one of your favorites mm. of George. Why do you feel that way? Well, just because of the surprisingness of it. You know, that has stayed with me. Um, you know, I, I mean, I guess as an album, I may I might like... All Things Must Pass better as a conventional rock album, and the same with... Uh, Cloud uh, Nine. Several, or, yeah, Cloud you know. Nine. I mean, a, a, a number of his his albums. But this, you know, because it was the first glimpse of, you know, George's world on its own, and because mm. um, there was just something about the time, as Darren said, it really was perfect for the time. I mean, this was late 1968. We already were... Like, everyone who had been sort of shocked and surprised and puzzled by George's Indian things until this point now was used to it and accepted it and you know I mean it had been since Revolver really this was two years later and you know so here was some more of it but also other stuff and it you know it just all together gave you this glimpse of you know what what kind of stuff is George into you know besides Indian music there's the you know, skiing, and there's uh, Red Lady 2, and you know, Drilling Home. I mean, just so much different stuff. And the other thing was, um, I think I was telling you when we started discussing this uh, at the end of the last show, uh, 
there was like a yoga craze at the time. And so I was sort of doing some of that. And there was, in particular, there was an issue of a magazine called I. Do either of you remember I Magazine? It's E-Y-E. No. Ah. No. Well, I, uh, Captain. that was a great magazine. And, uh, and in fact, they had um, a lot of a number of interesting Beatles things in there, including um, a cover of uh, John and Paul based on you know, taken at some point during that May 1968 trip to announce Apple, the trip to New York. And uh, they had a yoga article illustrated with a rather comely female yoga practitioner and I would put on Wonderwall music and I'd sit there with my eye magazine and, you know, read the stuff. I mean, there was text telling you what you were supposed to do and all that and, you know, and try and do it and, and basically do the whole album's worth, you know, for as a session of, you know, yoga. Now, obviously, some of it worked better than others. I mean, the Indian stuff is very conducive to that. And something like Red Lady 2, maybe not so much, but, you know, it... it, it 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 didn't really matter, you know. You're still putting your your ankle behind your neck or whatever the, whatever uh-huh. it was, you know. And whether it's Red Lady too or a bunch of sitars, it's fine, you know. So I I just have very vivid memories of all that, and it was just a great time and a, a, a you know a great feeling. And um, actually, probably the last time I did any exercise. <laughs> so. <laughs> Please don't mention ankles going behind the neck. I, just felt, <laughs> I got a sharp pain right in my knee. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, Darren, after you're all, you know, back together, you can do that, too. <laughs> oh, no. No. I won't. There'll be no. a new injury. Have to say, but, it uh, was probably easier when I was 14 than it would be now, but... Right. You know. <laughs> so. All right. Okay, so, you know, it would be spectacular if they somehow found a lot of outtakes and would release a uh, double album, perhaps in a suitcase of, you know, the extended Wonderwall. I mean, the last version they put out uh, in the Apple box did have the take of uh, the inner light, the instrumental take of it, and... uh, with, as Ken said, George's instructions to the musicians at the top, and also the Remo 4 in the first place. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, a couple of, I think there was one other outtake, so, you know, probably there isn't an awful lot, but um, I'd I'd be happy to hear another album of this kind of stuff, whatever he was, uh, was toying with. Yeah, there was a, there was a track called Almost Shankara. Right. That was included. It's like, I believe, five minutes of Indian music. Mm-hmm. You know, and actually, last week when um, I was was playing this one day, uh, you know, just to sort of refamiliarize myself with it, and it's it's in my chronological George Harrison playlist on my computer, and it went into electronic sound, and it, it actually it actually was a little while before I realized that we were no longer in. Wonderwall music. I mean, you know, it, just, it was sort of like because it's uh, you know those first couple of albums of his were just so different from everything else he ever did. So anyway, uh, I, I guess the point of this show was for those of you who have passed this by or not looked into it at all or whatever. I mean, this is it really is a great album uh, and it's worth giving a spin if you haven't listened to it for a while it's definitely worth revisiting so let us go around and get our contact information uh start with darren all right if you want to send me a message you can email me at wfuv and the email address is darren devivo spelled out uh d-a-r-r-e-n-d-e-v-i-v-o at wfuv.org Or go to Facebook and like my radio page. It's Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Uh, That's the full name of the page. That's the one I prefer you uh, to go to as opposed to the one just uh, called Darren DeVivo. Go to my uh, radio page, like it, and we'll be in contact that way. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, due to my uh, 
due to this knee injury and the surgery that I have coming up this this Monday, the 20th. Uh, I'm actually not going to be on the air on WFUV for, let's just say, for a while. But um, I'll post stuff on the Facebook page on my progress and uh, when I'll be returning. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Ken? Uh, you can reach me by email at everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. One quick thing, I just did another interview with Alex Kane. Alex is one of two authors who wrote a book on Ringo called Ringo Starr and the Beatles Beat, exploring all of Ringo's contributions as a drummer and percussionist in uh, in the Beatles. And um, I did an interview with Alex and the other co-author, Terry McCusker, not that long ago. This is a different interview with only Alex alone because Alex and Terry just put out a new book of uh, Ringo's work on the White Album in connection with the 50th anniversary called Ringo's White Album. (laughs) So it's all a discussion on Ringo's drumming on the White Album. We even talk about Paul's drumming on Dear Prudence and back in the USSR and what he thinks of it. Uh, Alex and Terry are both uh, drummers from Liverpool. So that's on my page called Interviews, page four. Uh, that's on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. And don't forget, Weekly Beatles Trivia every week, where you can win a, one of nine great prizes. And uh, again, KenMichaelsRadio.com for that. One of which, as we know, uh, the questions has to do with Doris Day, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And if you listen to when we were talking about Doris earlier, you'd know both answers. Okay. Okay, and the easiest way to contact me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can contact all of us by email uh, at our the show's address, which is th- one big word, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have a Twitter account, which is things we said fab or at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page for the show, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. So, don't forget to uh, give Wonderwall a spin and write us your impressions if you are so inclined. And uh, for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Adios. Adios.